Equal access to justice is a core American value. In each episode of Talk Justice, an LSC podcast, we'll explore ways to expand access to justice and illustrate why it is important to the legal community, business, government, and the general public. Talk Justice is sponsored by the Leaders' Council of the Legal Services Corporation. Welcome to Talk Justice, an LSC podcast. I'm Ron Flagg, president of the Legal Services Corporation. I'm joined today by Martha Minow. Martha has taught at Harvard Law School since 1981. She served as dean of Harvard Law School between 2009 and 2017, and as the inaugural Morgan and Helen Chu dean and professor. Martha has served on an enormous number of boards and a wide range of boards and commissions, and I'll mention just two of them in the access to justice space that we're going to be talking about today. Martha served as vice chair of the board of the Legal Service Corporation and currently as co-chair of the Access to Justice Project of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Earlier this year, Martha was elected to chair the board of directors of the MacArthur Foundation. Martha, welcome, and thanks for joining the podcast. It's great to have so many different perspectives from just one guest. Wonderful to be here, and Ron, I just have to thank you for your extraordinary service to LSC and more broadly to pro bono and public dimensions of law. Well, that's very kind of you. I was trained at a good law school, and (laughs) uh, I learned everything I knew there. Before jumping into the present and the future, I want to ask you a question about the past. You clerked for Justice Thurgood Marshall about 40 years ago, and what are some of the enduring memories of that experience, and and how did it and does it affect your perspective subsequently and today? Well, it was probably one of the most extraordinary professional experiences of my life. There's no question about that. He had been my hero, uh, one of the inspirations for going to law school. So working with him closely for a year was an opportunity to see him at work, to hear his stories about the civil rights movement, and to see a really smart lawyer picking his issues. And that's one of the enduring lessons. One of his mantras was, pick your battles, because he could be dissenting in every case, Um, but he picked his battles. Another enduring lesson was procedure. Honestly, I ended up teaching procedure, which I have taught now for decades and have a casebook on procedure because he always said, if your case is weak on the substance, you want to know procedure better than anyone else. Well, choices is a great segue into my next question, because as I look at you know, what I already know, but as I read your CV, your teaching, your research, your work outside of academia— have focused on an enormous swath of topics, including constitutional law, procedure you just mentioned, privacy, family law, international criminal law, education, civil rights, freedom of speech. You have a book released in the last couple of years on forgiveness under the law, among many other topics. Yet I know from personal experience, from working with you here at LSC and in other contexts, that over the past decade alone, You've chosen to devote hundreds, probably thousands of hours to access to civil justice. Given everything else you're an expert in, why that focus? Well, thanks for that question and the kind framing of it. You know, I have the great good fortune of having a job that does allow me to select how I spend my time outside of teaching and even select what to teach about. I am, for many, many years, very set on one through line in all the things that I do, which is focused on disadvantage and the distance between the promise of America and the reality. And disadvantage along lines of race and class, uh, disability, gender. Um, We have a society that in its founding documents and in its enduring commitments claims commitment to equality. And yet we, for complex reasons, have set up systems where that just is not realized. And one of the places where that distance is maybe even more pronounced than others is civil justice. We have a system where most individual rights are not realized unless individuals assert them. And if people don't have the money or the time or the legal training to be aware of their problems, much less how to assert their rights, 
then the rights are not effectuated. And that's why access to civil justice to me is so important. You've addressed it in a lot of ways in your work with LSC, with the uh, American Academy, and also in your writing. The American Journal of Law and Equality recently published your article entitled, appropriately and shortly enough, Access to Justice. In the article, you describe the plentiful arguments for access to civil justice and that access to justice should be guaranteed. I want to ask you about that guarantee notion. In a world of limited resources, why should that be the case? Why should uh, access to justice be guaranteed? You know, it's less visible than direct aid, for example, in the wake of a natural disaster or hunger. It's, it's less visible and seems more remote. And yet, this is one of the best ways to effectuate solutions to exactly those kinds of problems. You and I have had the chance to look closely at the disaster, particularly for poor people following natural disasters. And if they don't have the ability to navigate the federal agencies, the state agencies, they won't get the aid that they need. They won't get the help that they need. They may lose everything. And so whether it's natural disasters, hunger, schooling, in area after area, the laws are not terrible. They can be improved, but the problem is effectuating them. So that leads to a follow-up. Again, whether you're talking about housing, whether you're talking about preventing domestic violence, whether you're talking about veterans' benefits, the laws are on the books. It's a matter of simply providing people the rights that are already on the books. That seems like a straightforward proposition to me. Why is there not more support for legal services for those who cannot afford them if all we're trying to do is make sure that the laws that Congress and state and local legislatures have enacted are enforced? You know, I think in part uh, it is that it looks arcane. It looks hard to understand. It doesn't look like it's direct service. But take something as simple as expungement of a criminal record. People who have a criminal record are facing often insurmountable barriers to finding housing and jobs and credit. And many states and communities realize that. And they've adopted laws that allow for individuals, if they can show that they have been law abiding and time has passed, they should be able to clear their record. But they're not self-effectuating. They have to be triggered. There has to be a request and there has to be persistence. There's an example where we're leaving money, opportunity, equality on the table because of the failure to enforce the laws. The, the obstacles, though, are many. One, besides the arcane quality of law that it looks distant and remote, let's just be frank. A lot of people in this country don't like lawyers and don't like the legal system and assume that it's a kind of tax on humanity rather than an enablement of people who, who really need help. There are a lot of people who don't like the conflict that's manifest by litigation. You know, Shakespeare famously said, kill all the lawyers. Maybe that was taken out of context. But there is a negative view. If you ask Americans, who do they admire? Lawyers are not high up on the list. Nor, frankly, is the courts and access to the courts high on the list of people's agendas of what they think need help. There's other reasons, though, as well. I mean, interestingly, some people who are deeply devoted to the issues of poverty, racial inequality, also don't care about access to civil justice, in part because they have other priorities like criminal justice. Well, it turns out that the intersections between the criminal and the civil system are so profound, just like the expungement point I made a minute ago, or the debt relief for people who are facing piles and piles of criminal fines, but it ends up having these repercussions for employment and housing. So some people put access to civil justice low on their priority because they don't see the interconnections with something like criminal justice, or because they think it's just too partial a problem. They would prefer much more radical change, much more redistributive change, rather than enforce the housing code, make housing free, you know, I, I just am of the view here and elsewhere, let's not make the best be the enemy of the good. 
and let's work on what is available and also for those who want to on more dramatic change. I do think that there's even a further problem, which is a lot of people have compassion fatigue. They're overwhelmed by how much suffering and unfairness there is and trying to find, you know, well, where can they put their philanthropic dollars or their volunteer time or just even talking with friends and family about what to have a priority about. There's a kind of overwhelming quality of how much unfairness there is. And I think that being overwhelmed by the scale of the problem is part of the reason for the difficulties here, which is frankly one of the reasons I spend time trying to identify why this is a solvable problem. Unlike many others, we actually have the tools to solve this problem. I think you make a good point. And I, before I ask a, another question, I, I do want to make a point, which is uh, during the pandemic, which has heightened these inequities that you spoke about at the outset, we had an enormous crisis, and we still do, with regard to evictions. And people collaborated. They came up with a, a moratorium to uh, uh, pause evictions to uh, uh, as a, a public health measure. Uh, they came up with $46 billion in emergency rental assistance and then legal aid programs and other service providers around the country. And pro bono helpers were galvanized and literally more than a million households were kept in their homes as a result of programs initiated virtually overnight with the help of offices that were created, you know, from whole cloth from the ground up to get out the uh, rental assistance. So that is a uh, an example of what you just said, that these problems can be solved when people work together. Let me say one more thing about that, which is that's a perfect example of systemic understanding because the aid went not only to renters, but also to landlords. So it was understanding that the systemic nature of this problem was such that if the landlords aren't getting their rent paid, they're in trouble too. So the oh. relief had to put their arms around the whole problem. Exactly. The key was getting the governmental assistance into the hands of the intended beneficiaries. And that's where civil legal aid and other service providers played a, uh, an enormous role. So that's maybe one uh, bright spot. You described a lot of uh, obstacles to access to justice, painted overall a pretty bleak pictures. Do you see reasons for hope? You know, I really do. As we're saying, we have examples of solutions that work, uh, nimbleness. I'm fascinated to see, you know, across the country, state level access to justice commissions that are responsive to their own local communities. So Tennessee's commission works with churches and other religious organizations offering legal clinics and community services, recruiting lawyers and paralegals and others to assist low-income individuals. Because in that community, that's a meaningful network. There are innovations such as the courts in Texas have devised forms for divorce, consumer, and other civil matters that are just fill in the blank so that the filing of a claim is much less difficult. And also Texas and other places are working with public libraries to offer access to forms for free and other forms of legal assistance. You know, almost every community has a library, so a place that people can get help. There are so many innovations. You know, I'm a big fan of Maine's Pine Tree Legal Assistance, which developed an interactive website to assist military veterans across the country and their families, the stateside site. So as they try to navigate veterans benefit programs, child support, other legal issues, there is an easy place to go and get answers and get responses when, you know, frankly, government agencies are often very difficult to navigate. There's also the breakthroughs in technology uh, Legal Services Corporation, under your leadership, Ron, has done a great job with the technology innovation grants. And there are a lot of law schools also that are involving students, whether they're law students or computer science students or others, to find ways to use artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, and create digital tools that help individuals resolve their own legal problems. So, yes, I see many, many signs for hope. And the pandemic was in many ways a jumpstart for some innovations that had taken decades to get off the ground, like 
using Zoom for hearings for people who otherwise would have to take three buses and not be able to make it. As as, uh, Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, Bridget McCormick, who I know is a friend of yours, has at this point famously said the pandemic was not the crisis civil justice wanted, but it was the crisis civil justice needed to uh, change the way we go about it. You mentioned students, and obviously you've been teaching for decades. Have you seen changes among your students in their attitudes toward access to justice and their interest level to engage in public interest or pro bono work? You know, there have been rising interest and sometimes lagging interest, but we're in the period of rising interest right now. A lot of students are very interested in what role they can play individually in pro bono work, what role they can play in designing an app that might help, for example, people expunge their criminal record, how they can think about business tools to address some of the issues that we're discussing. And so I think this is a period of time when students in law schools, but not just in law school, are a tremendous resource for tackling problems in their own communities and in the communities of their own schools. You know, I think that students, uh, it's very hard to generalize about students. They have many, many interests, many, many backgrounds. But here's just a a way in which schools can actually influence students and, and facilitate activities. So when I started teaching here, there was no pro bono requirement. There was one clinic. The students who were engaged in providing legal services to poor people while they were in law school was a tiny group. You know, fast forward to today. We have a pro bono requirement. It is resoundly exceeded year after year after year with the average number of hours served outstripping the required hours tenfold, maybe a hundredfold. And clinics, you know, we are one of many schools that now we have uh, maybe 16 clinics, so many opportunities for students to provide legal services. So that's a big change, and it makes it easier for students to act on their motivations. Access to justice, one of the reasons we're talking about it, and I know one of the reasons you're so committed to it, is because it's really a cornerstone of our country, of our democracy. Broadening our conversation a bit and thinking about the broader challenges to democracy that we've seen beyond access to justice in the civil system, uh, what gives you hope these days regarding the challenges to our democracy? Well, the challenges would be the topic of another podcasts, the challenges to respecting elections, guarding against voter suppression. But, you know, there are, as you say, so many of our founding documents, the phrase above the uh, front door of the U.S. Supreme Court, equal justice under law. These are the elements of the Pledge of Allegiance and connecting the dots between those fundamental commitments And what's going on in local communities, that gives me hope. And I see more and more of that happening. I see state courts becoming really centers for community education. Boston has done that. New York has done that. Vermont has done that. So that there are events that bring people to the courthouse, not just because they have a conflict, maybe they'll never have one, but to learn about how the system works and to play a role and to learn about history. And I think that's a sign of hope as well as these innovations that we've been discussing, you know, having a kiosk in a courthouse or another public office that people can use the way that they do when they're ordering something from Amazon and finding ways to connect with how people get information today, how people actually navigate the world. Those give me real hope. Martha, you were recently elected chair of the board of the MacArthur Foundation. Again, given everything else you do, all of the other alternative vehicles for working in the arenas you'd like to focus on, why do you devote time to foundation work? You know, foundations as part of the nonprofit sector are one of the great strengths of America. It is the seedbed, frankly, uh, and the laboratory for democracy in the sense that people can participate in governance in their own local communities and in volunteering work. MacArthur Foundation, I've been very honored to serve there on the board for 10 years and did just become a board chair. Works globally, but also in my hometown of Chicago. 
And to be able to empower local community organizations and their leaders to be able to be responsive uh, to crises like gun violence in Chicago, that's very meaningful. And at the same time, to be able to direct resources to more strategic solutions. Studies show that those societies that have a rich and active civil society, nonprofit organizations, philanthropic work, they are the places where people find meaning in their day-to-day lives and where democracies thrive. And to the contrast, in those countries that adopted apparently, seemingly democratic constitutions, but did not have those larger context of civil society, they've had a much more difficult time creating stability and reliability in their democratic systems. Final question on yet another important institution in uh, the United States and one that's been important to you for decades uh, as a professor and as a dean, uh, and that is uh, America's law schools. And as you said, lawyers and Law school's not always the most uh, popular people or institutions, but uh, I think you and I agree that they can play an enormous role in improving the lives of Americans. What can law schools do to close the justice gap? That is the enormous gulf between the civil legal needs of our low-income neighbors and the available resources to meet those needs. You know, besides the opportunities given to current students, such as clinics and coursework and labs creating apps and uh, pro bono requirements, law schools all have alumni. It's an enormous resource. And we are heading into a period of massive retirements of my generation, your generation, and their able and active, and many of them looking to do something meaningful. I think that law schools could be really effective mobilizers, showing the opportunities for retiring lawyers or any practicing lawyer to be able to get back to their own communities and you know, taking the coordination problem out of their laps. I also, look, I believe in research. I believe in knowledge. I have a colleague here who argues that the medical profession really progressed from a time that you were as likely to die if you went to a hospital to the extraordinary work of healthcare now when it started to collect data and analyze it, when it actually engaged in serious research, evidence-based practices. We're about 100 years behind in the legal profession, uh, the medical profession, and therefore we have some catching up to do, and that's an important role for law schools as well. It's also an important role for the Legal Services Corporation. We have, in part as a result of your uh, leadership on our board, a now growing and thriving uh, Office of Data Governance and Analysis, so that my hope is five years from now, when uh, I give an elevator speech about what LSC does, it's not just as the largest funder of civil legal aid in America, but as an enormous resource to legal aid programs across the country of data that will help optimize their use of their resources. As we've seen, you know, for example, in Cleveland, Colleen Connors' leadership, that if you have that data resource, you can be nimble. You can deploy the resources where they are going to be most effective. Martha, thank you so much for joining me today, but uh, much more importantly, Thank you for your leadership on access to justice, wearing so many different hats. And uh, on a personal note, thank you for uh, your guidance and counsel over the course of uh, the last 10 years and stay well. Thank you, wonderful to be here, Ron. Thanks for all that you do. Podcast guest speakers' views, thoughts, and opinions are solely their own and do not necessarily represent the Legal Services Corporation's views, thoughts, or opinions. The information and guidance discussed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice. You should not make decisions based on this podcast content without seeking legal or other professional advice.